Welcome, everyone, to our Northampton Commission on Disabilities Roundtable. We're so happy that all of you could come tonight. I'm Tori Eckland. I'm the chair of the Northampton Commission on Disabilities. Um, and I want to start by announcing that this meeting is being audio and videotaped. Um, I also want to um, ask people, I want to make sure that this is a dialogue and not a monologue. So please, um, if you do have any comments or questions or anything, please feel free to raise your hand and you'll be called on. Patty will let me know who's raising their hand and I will, um, I will call on you. And also, um, so that we can all know who everyone is, um, if when you have a question or make a comment, if you could say who you are and where you're from. Um, I know that we have name placards and name tags, but that may not be accessible to all, especially me, so um, just feel free to, to do that. Um, so I want to start off by introducing um, Jeffrey Dugan, who is the Assistant Director for Community Service at the Massachusetts Office on Disability, and um, we're really happy to have him here, and we're going to start by asking him to um, say a few words and talk about um, the work that he's been doing and his office has been doing, and then we'll have questions and have more open discussion. Okay. Um, well, can we do introductions first um, around the table? Just yeah. in the room so I can tailor. I wasn't going to do that because we were expecting so many people, but um, we can totally do that now. So just um, name and affiliation, so I have an idea of totally. any coordinators around the room or community <laughs> around the room. Yeah. Or others. Um, so Frank. Sure. Frank, Frank Seafield, the commissioner in the Chickabee's Commission on Disabled. We just bring together our ADA coordinator, so. Great, thanks for coming. Thank you. Andy Bristol, Access Specialist, Post Office. Oh, great. Don Sluter, Great ADA. Hi, Laurie Cassidy, West Springfield, Council on Aging, Commission on Disabilities, and I'm actually here for our ADA coordinator, Sandra McFadden. Okay, fine, I remember. Ruth McGrath, member and secretary. I've been on the commission for a little over seven years now. Anna Coyle, member of the Committee on Disabilities. And you are my vice chair. Give yourself credit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> She's the vice chair. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm Tori Eckland again, and I'm the chair of the commission. Yeah, I'm Patty Shaughnessy. Uh, I serve as the uh, Northampton Council on Aging and Senior Center Director and I'm the ADA Coordinator for the City of Northampton. City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge, 17 years, and I'm also a member of the Commission on Disabilities. Heather Pudrewitz, Town Administrator, Southampton. Uh, Eleanor Warnoff, Town of Williamsburg. James Winston, I'm uh, also on the Northampton Commission on Disability. I'm a uh, Social Security Disability Attorney. Kevin Scarborough, Town of Deerfield, and I'm the ADA coordinator as of like two weeks ago. <laughs> Great. All right, well, welcome. Uh, uh, so, and I'm Jeff Dugan from the Office on Disability. I've been at MOD for close to um, has it been 13 or 14 years now. Um, I originally started at Metro West Center for Independent Living uh, in Framingham. Um, so, so it's good to see we have a wide mix of people in the room. And so, I don't know how many of you know the Mass Office on Disability. I brought a lot of material up there and some of it's gonna be specific to commissions on disabilities. Some of it will be specific to ADA coordinators or towns looking at their obligations of what they have to do to comply with the ADA. And I just wanna, can I go through a couple of these things just mm -hmm. to show you what we brought? Um, mm -hmm. So we are the Commonwealth's ADA coordinator. That's our agency. We, we, we look at the, not only the executive branch of state government, but the other branches of state government to ensure that they're meeting their obligations under the ADA. Typically, programmatic access and you know, when programs are being offered or services being provided or buildings being built, we are there to ensure that compliance is being met under the ADA. We also, have, uh, we also offer technical assistance to municipalities, to commissions on disabilities, to independent living centers, to really anyone who has a question related to disability, they can, they can call our office where we have people who have a hotline where people can call and can really try to answer as long as the question is related to disability, whether it be housing, whether it be discrimination, whether it be building code, 
uh, or whether it be just general information about what services are out there, our office can handle those calls. Sometimes those calls may be transferred to a local independent living center because they're going to be more knowledgeable about the local efforts on the local level or, or their services that they offer would be appropriate. But um, So we're available for, for really any question related to this building and this brochure will talk about that. We actually house the uh, federally mandated uh, client it assistance program, so if people are not getting services from the voc rehab type of services within the Commonwealth, we are their appeal or their advocacy uh, procedure. What I usually recommend for, for commissions on disabilities who have questions, that they, that they because they are typically volunteer groups, they are made up of volunteers, um, that typically if they get a question that they don't know how to answer because the expertise may not be at that table, I recommend strongly that they either reach out to the Mass Office of Disability or reach out to the local independent living center. And around the table, it's really Starbrooks, right, is this region's uh, independent living center's area. However, there are 11 in Massachusetts, so depending on where you live, it will depend on which independent living center you could call. For ADA coordinators, I would strongly suggest that if there are questions that come up in your daily duties, that we have, uh, you know, our office could be a resource for that. Uh, to be for information. Uh, we have, depending on what the question would be, whether it be policy related or per, you know, looking to see if you uh, have employment related ADA questions, um, our office, we have somebody in our office that can handle that side of things. If you're looking at building or, or ensuring programmatic access, we have uh, other people in our office that can help with that as well. That typically would fall to me for the building side of things, for the policy and employment rights and things like that. Um, we have people in our office that can try to answer that, those questions for ADA coordinators. So, long story short, there's about 12 different brochures out there, or informational brochures. And, um, can we get the, that window there? It's just really bright on okay. that individual. I'm sorry. I can get it. No, I'll, I'll do it. I can. Um, so, so, just to quickly go over one of the critical pieces for everybody is we have a disability laws booklet that we put out, uh, last updated in. January of 2012, it's in the process of being updated again. But this really captures all the various laws in Massachusetts that pertain to disability. These are just synopsis, but they have links in there and they will have uh, referrals onto the actual regulation themselves or the federal counterpart if, you know, if there is one. Um, for commissions on disabilities, we have a general description up there that talk about general duties and responsibilities of commissions. Really good for new commissions and uh, it actually has sample bylaws that a commission can newly be informed. However, in the back, there's about a list of 10 different goals that commissions typically take on. Um, and it's just a good sample for if people are looking to figure out what their commission can do in their community. The 10 goals in there typically spell out what commissions typically do in their community. Very quickly, I brought two of the general laws that would apply to commissions on disabilities. If you're a formalized commission, that means your city or town has adopted certain general laws, Chapter 40, Section 8J, or Chapter 40, Section 22G. Um, and those are up there for, for as, as some resources as well. Um, for ADA coordinators, and really commissions as well, I've given you about eight or nine pages here that are from a booklet called the ADA Title II Action Guide. Uh, it is available online, so I've only given you eight pages, but it is about a 200-page book with a supplement on employment. But this is a great what I've passed out is really a, a great, easy to understand explanation of what the five administrative responsibilities under Title II of the ADA that a city or town must comply with. Um, and it just really puts it into plain English along with the legalese beside it, or the links beside it to it. So it's a really good, useful tool for commissions to understand what a, a, their city or town is obligated to do. And it's really good a primer for newly appointed ADA coordinators who need to understand really what their role is because it's not just a simple role. There's a lot of responsibilities there. Obviously, depending on the size of your community, it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, and know that MOD and, and Starbucks will be there to offer assistance to you uh, as, as ADA coordinators in the room. For everybody, pretty much there have been some updates. In 2008, there were some updates to the ADA. I won't go through all of them, but some of the big changes were service dogs and how those animals were what's protected now that can go into a public place. It's now a service dog or a miniature horse. It's no longer other forms of animals while they're domestic. 
Um, and Massachusetts is kind of reeling with that, trying to figure out what Massachusetts is going to do. We used to cover companion animals, or not companion animals, but other animals as defined as service animals, but we're not sure if that's going to be enforced anymore under the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. So right now, the feds are calling it for dogs or miniature horses. They also have other things in here, talking about ticketing policies and um, and effective communication obligations and, and different things here that a nice synopsis of some of the updates. For ADA coordinators and commissions who've been asked to survey a building for ADA compliance, there's a nice ADA checklist out there that's either downloadable or computer fillable that can help you do, especially for ADA coordinators, it can help you do an analysis, at least a brief walkthrough to figure out what barriers might be present here. And it's a really good, useful tool. Um, to know about. And it actually covers new things now, such as recreational facilities and, and other things that the ADA has expanded their coverage on. For everybody up there, there's also the ADA.gov website. This is just a little blurb to remind you that that is a, the, the Department of Justice's <coughs> homepage for all things, everything related to ADA. It's a great resource uh, and they have a lot of information there as well. Um, and the last thing I want to share with commissions is when you're working with local businesses, if you decide that's something you as a Commission on Disability want to do, there are some tax, some tax breaks for local businesses to make changes to remove barriers. Mm. Um, it's not a whole lot, but for small businesses or the businesses that qualify, because there is a qualifying part here, um, it's a great icebreaker if you're working with a business uh, to, to offer them that, look, there might be some tax credits if you improve your communication access, like if you create a menu in Braille or or need interpreters or other things, there are definitely some tax credits that can be taken advantage of. Or if they're doing renovations to their building, they might be able to take advantage of a tax deduction if they're improving accessibility. So it's a great underutilized resource that's out there. Um, so that's everything I brought. What I'd like to do is, you know, obviously, and you guys are in control of uh, Tori and, and mm -hmm. Patty, uh, where you want to direct the next part of it. But just know that we're a resource here. Really. Big takeaway. Yeah. Does anyone um, have any questions? Yes, I do. You mentioned about businesses in general of uh, doing something that would give them a tax break for handicapped accessible to their businesses. We did do the Braille menus here in the city of Northampton. Mm -hmm. We worked very hard for many, many months organizing that and also working with the bid here in Northampton. I don't know if they were ever informed that they would get a tax break because we knew nothing about that. And that's not a common, that's not an uncommon thing. The IRS really, mm. the advertising has been from Local advocates, uh, we've been trying to push it for a while because it's one of the most underutilized really good tax job. breaks that a business mm -hmm. can take advantage of. And it's whether the accountant knows about it or not, whoever, wherever they get their, their things done. I don't know what the laws are for how far back they can go. So if this was a year ago or two years ago, there might be a window that they might still be able to take advantage of it. I mean, it's not going to save them millions of dollars. No. It'll save them you know, a portion, a small amount. There's, there's definitely limits to it. But any small amount really helps. Exactly. Or it can be a project doable or not doable. It's an incentive. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, that's really good because we are looking at furthering our braille menus and large menus. So we have a little bit of knowledge, and you being the ADA coordinator, to look up what do we have to do to start approaching these other businesses and letting them know this is what we've been told, this is what you possibly might get. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think so, it's so that's up there. What I have typically recommended for yeah. municipalities is anytime, you know, this is the good home for this would be a packet that the building inspector gives out for any new building permit, regardless of what that permit's for, whether, you know, nine out of 10 times it might be residential, but for that one business that can take advantage of it, it's gonna really say, okay, we're doing the bathroom, but since everybody's there, we might get a lower quote or lower bid, and we might get this tax deduction where I'll do the entrance as well. And you know, so it might be just that eye opener that they need, but if they don't know about it, obviously they're not taking advantage of it. No, so. exactly. And both Patty and I were talking about for our next meeting, bringing in our building inspector 
of businesses locally who don't have handicapped accessible of which way we can go as a commission to help them to make an area accessible. Definitely. So, you know, there's, that's my end, I guess that's the end, my portion of the end of the tax breaks. It's just a really, it's a great resource out there and I know yeah. everyone takes one back with them and, and gives it to the building department and yeah. just throw it in with everything else. <laughs> it's probably going to open a few extra doors that may not have been opened before. So, mm -hmm. very much. And Tori, I don't want to necessarily run the meeting because I don't, you know, I know you have an agenda. So, I don't know if I explained, you know, or um, I guess if you want to open it up, to, however you want to open it up, to questions or, you know, people might just have generalized questions. I'm not sure. So. Okay. Well, are you able to stay for till six? Oh, by all means. Yeah, oh, that's until great. Okay, then, so then that's my. Okay, so great. So maybe that's that's what we'll do. Then we'll just open it up to general discussion, and you'll be here to answer questions. Um, I also neglected to mention at the very beginning of the meeting that um, there's a sign-up sheet, there's a sign-in sheet going around. So um, make sure to put your contact information on it if you want us to have it. And we also just would like to know who was here. Um, thank you, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, so, uh, my name is Frank Seafield, Chief of the Commission on the Sabre. Mm -hmm. That tax break has gotten uh, people roll their eyes when I tell them what they have to do. They roll back when I tell them they can get $20,000 back per year. <laughs> uh, wow. This is a definite um, icebreaker? Yeah. Incentive. It's like, you, here, we'll give you $20,000 back. If you qualify, here's $20,000. $5,000 credit off the top. Very easy and nice for a person to uh, have an incentive to start making uh, accessibility. So, it, and that was, excuse me, through the building inspector that you worked with on this? Actually, this was myself. This commission, we've done... Uh, been proactive on that, where we'll uh, approach a business and say, you know, you can do this, this, and this will be paid for. I just had uh, the city of Chicopee handicapped parking signs are controlled or approved by the commission itself. Uh, when, in fact, we just had our first business request a handicapped parking sign at their location. First thing that was done is I did an audit, I did an audit on the outside. Uh, couldn't go inside, but you know, I told them, "Yeah, you need this, this, and this." And you know, here we can get paid for you too. But um, up with signs, you know, it, it's like no brainer. These guys, your talent's paid for already. It goes, it's done. So that's, that's what we've been doing on it. That's that's fantastic, Mike. Maybe you had a question. Yeah, I did. Um, the question is just, how do you make a proposal that you want, you would like to see something done? How do you make a proposal? To, so would it be something in the city or like city property or, or town property or would it well, be a business property? Well, actually, I've got the proposal right here if you'd like to take a look at it. I think I've got enough so everybody can. I mean, I guess just, let's just do a, we can do a kind of a, a broad what idea I, of what it is and then we can probably talk offline afterwards. Okay. Yeah. What I would like is for two or three foot plants for the buildings to be in the Northampton Police Department. Uh, those lands can be taken out by an individual um, for some value of the land, whatever, but taken out for that person's use and control during the period for which the lease works. The person can then take the land and use it around the camp. So, so I believe the procedure would be that at an original commission or at a commission on disabilities meeting. Um, is this? Kind of an add-on to the commission meeting, or is this kind of your monthly commission meeting? Okay. Um, 
Well, this is our meeting for September. Okay. We'll be meeting again in October. Okay, so is this for no, this is for Northampton? Yes, in Northampton is characterized by a number of one step up buildings. So to get into restaurants, to get into retailers, right. to get into businesses. This the one we can do is improve accessibility by eliminating the one step up. So here's so first of all, I believe the procedure would be that you'd raise that issue to the chair and the chair would take it and probably review it next month at their next commission meeting because it has to go on to the minutes or to the agenda. So that's the official process. So, but I have some cautionary advice as well about the use of portable ramps. Um, maybe for their private use, although I don't want the town to allow them for it. But if it's for private use to get into a business or into somewhere else, there is strong state building code in Massachusetts that may prevent that. Um, even though it would be, in a, but although we'd have to look at really how they would play a part in that. Um, if a business were to come out and put a temporary ramp down, the, the building code's triggered, there are certain things that need to be done. If John Smith comes out and puts something on there, which the business may or may not actually want, because it's a liability to them. So if there is some big concern. The injury to an individual for, some, for a temporary ramp that may or may not meet the building specifications under the codes of Massachusetts. So, their position. so, so it's up to the liability right. called on them. Right, and I definitely think that that should be brought to the commission. The mm -hmm. commission can weigh into it, talk with the building inspector, weigh in with you know the public safety, which that's where it's going to fall because it's going to be at their location where they can pick it up, number one. But number two, they're going to be temporarily altering a business in town. And that triggers building code in a business. It's, and I know there's a comment down there from the city council. I'm not necessarily, a, you know, I can't say I'm a folks, but I'm, I'm not. It's, it's a good idea. I just don't know if, if it's going to work because of practicality. Of so we could discuss that at our next meeting. And, <coughs> and, write it. and so to raise a proposal, you need to raise it to Tori probably today and give her a copy of that so that she can put that in the agenda for, for next month. Because they need a, they need oh, a, I think we already have it on our agenda. Oh. Okay, well, I, I mean, that's the other route, I guess. <laughs> they can take it on there. They may give it to the commission for advisement. And I know there's a Yes, story. thank you. Uh, Michael Nagy has been placed on our agenda at City Council doing a presentation on what he's talking about. And I think it's really great that Michael has formed this group. But I have had a couple of people approaching me, yeah. and they're lawyers, okay, who have said to me that they have great concerns of liability also with business people, okay, taking that liability on. So, but I think it's good. I think Michael's coming to City Council. He can talk about it. We'll bring it forth. Patty is supposed to get a hold of the building inspector to come to our meeting next month. And yes, you're correct. There are state codes that have to be abided by. In, in Northampton, um, I work a lot with um, the DPW and the uh, building uh, commissioner. I mean, because I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the specifications. I don't know all the zoning. Um, so uh, I, I'm sure many of you rely on other uh, departments in your city or town uh, with accessibility issues. So here's the big thing. So the ADA promotes portable ramps. Uh, in the use of them to overcome certain barriers. Mm -hmm. However, in Massachusetts, those portable ramps really aren't much of portable of anything because we have, the building code doesn't really allow for the AD, you know, an ADA type of portable ramp. So that's really where this difference is. And when, so if an ADA coordinator is going throughout their town looking at ADA barriers and then they go to fix it, you've got to make sure that you're not just fixing it to meet ADA standards, you've got state triggers as well. Straight state codes. So, you know, a ramp, I'll use that as a, a permanent ramp, not a portal ramp, but a permanent ramp. You know, if you identify it you know, as, a, as a deficiency and you, you install an ADA compliant ramp, which is 36 inches wide, has one handrail on each side, and has the proper slope, you're technically not in conformance with, the, with our state building code, which mm -hmm. requires a 48 inch wide ramp, two handrails on each side, same slope, but um, but you could make a mistake that's going to end up costing <laughs> more than it was or, or, or having to apply for extra steps, maybe a variance or something to that effect. But, so that 
makes it difficult for ADA coordinators in Massachusetts because you identify these barriers, you want to go fix them, but you've got to fix them to the state standards. Mm -hmm. So portable ramp, and portable ramps is one of those big differences. The AAB really has taken jurisdiction over them. They have very strict compliance obligations for portable ramps. Um, and even our state building code, I believe, covers, and I'd have, we'd have to get some clarification on it, and the building inspector would answer that would be portable ramps even for private, like residential use. Mm -hmm. um, there may be building code that covers that. Um, a little bit out of my realm, but once you start putting portable onto a business, our state code 521 CMR is actually gonna kick in. So it's a great discussion to have. I think let's see where it can go and what it looks like. Um, because it's, you know, it might just be an eye opener for businesses as well. So mm -hmm. That they're gonna need more, not, not just mm -hmm. less. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in Chicopee, they've done it once. They redid the entire sidewalk. Unfortunately, they did those nice little brick things along the edge, which caused problems. But because they are going through and tearing it completely back up again to put in the sewer separation, this is the time I believe I'm probably going to call the AAB in to have a recommendation. I've seen some examples of very good ideas on how to do it. Like I said, there's a one step. I've had businesses actually have the DPW tear out the entrance ramp that they put in three times because it wasn't fit and able to get in. So if you get uh, enough businesses and enough people, you know, the state, maybe some of uh, the contractors uh, to get some ideas, there are a lot of sidewalk ideas out in the net. Uh, I know of one section that they actually, I believe, have four different uh, suggestions or videos showing their solutions. So it's, it's out there. You just have to look for it. And then you have to push. Um, the ADA coordinator from Lubbo was unable to come tonight um, because of uh, another um, work-related um, issue. Um, and, and he had a question about um, there's a, a complaint that's been filed with him as an ADA coordinator and he has to address that with the DPW and his, his um, interest is to know what's a reasonable amount of time to wait before they act on it, what's, what, what's a standard for other than us saying really it should be done immediately. So, just so I'm clear, was a complaint issued through a grievance procedure, or was it, is it a complaint against the individual, or a complaint against the, like, curb cut, or something that's It was a, a, against the town. About is something it? being non-compliant. Right, right. Okay. So, first of all, number one, they should see what, what their transition plan would identify. Uh, if it's, you know, depending on what, what it is. Does their transition plan identify it? Um, so, that would kind of start to give you a handle on, well, it's in our three-year master plan or it's in our whatever master plan. And now it's gonna look at, well, how, read, you know, not readily achievable, but how reasonable would it be to bump that up the prioritization list to make that the next curb cut or the, or the, the 50th curb cut we do instead of a thousand that we have to do on our list because we've received certain complaints about it. Um, it's kind of a, you know, they, so first of all, they should be in dialogue with that individual to figure out what exactly is, is happening there, um, what, the, what the problem is. So was it, you know, is it compliant with the ADA but not working for the individual? I mean, that's something as well. Or was it recently reconstructed and it's not compliant? And that might be a state building code issue. So there's a lot of avenues there of how this could be remedied. If it's an old existing kind of beat up curb cut that needs to be repaired at some point, you know, that should be identified number one in their transition plan. But number two, how will they start to prioritize that and move it up the list um, as, a, as a request? Um, with that said, obviously if it's preventing this individual from getting to, a, you know, where is this curb cut, I guess? Is it right, is it the one that gets you up onto to get into the council on aging here or is it, you know, is it out in the middle of the end of a street somewhere that they need to get access off of it? So there's a lot of ways, <coughs> I guess, weighing of that curb cut. Um, if a complaint's been filed, they will definitely want to 
um, and I know some comments coming up, so um, they will definitely want to weigh in in the conversation with the with the individual. And Andy is at hand. Yeah, Andy. Andy. Yeah, Andy. 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 Andy Bristol. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> um, I work for Stavros, but I live in Lobo. Um, I know where Eric's going to go. Um, I can rest assured that we have a very weak transition plan, if one at all. But every municipality should have the policies and procedures when a complaint comes in, if there's X amount of time to respond to that complaint, and then the steps beyond that as well. Um, and every municipality should have that in the... In the as part of the grievance procedure. As part of the grievance procedure, correct. Uh, and as part of the, part of the ADA notice. Um, did Eric mention what this particular item was about? No, it was just a very general okay. question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the commission is dealing with a few things, um, one of which was residential parking permits that we developed a policy for. Now, um, that's just happened in the past few months. And actually, the individual that had requested such has not responded, um, to my knowledge, to this date. So that will be closed out as far as following up on the request, but it's good that we have that policy and procedure now uh, that in the future we'll be able to deal with that. Um, there are some other access issues, um, some sidewalks that don't have curb cuts, um, some seating in uh, restaurants that is not accessible. Um, so these are things that maybe Eric's working on now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But yeah, there should be, he should be able to go back and look at the, pre the grievance procedure that the town has established um, and to work with the commission as well. So I will be contacting him soon. So for towns that may not know exactly where the grievance procedure is or they need to update it, in this packet, the five uh, action steps that I have here, one of them is the grievance procedure and there's actually a template in there about how you would respond who people would complain to, making sure that's publicly available so people know who they can raise that issue to. But the hard work's been done, the policy's been drafted in here, you just tailor it to, to your municipality. So it's, and probably go a little bit deeper into how you would handle like the after effects of, okay, we got the grievance, this is the process for it, but as Andy said, well, what, what do we do as a town as the next step? And that's gonna be individualized to each town, uh, about who goes to who and like, you know, might be, if it's, Construction related it might be they go and consult with the building inspector or they consult with DPW depending on what type of thing they're looking at. Or it could be HR related, human resource related. So it could be the HR person in town. Um, yeah. Because that, that's part of it as well. And that's a big animal that a lot of people don't necessarily realize is part of the ADA obligation. <coughs> and for the ADA coordinators in the room here, um, you guys do have a tough position because on one hand you're wanting to uh, protect the town against discrimination, but you also want to serve the people making the complaint, the person with a disability, to have a valid complaint. You want you know, mm -hmm. things to work out on both sides. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Absolutely. So um, we were thinking it would be good that we brought people together here and to, to have some more discussion just to hear from anyone here who wants to share about what kind of projects you've been working on in your various towns, what kinds of things are going well, what kinds of things are, are not going so well, and then maybe try to focus on ways that we might be able to collaborate. I also want to bring up, because we were talking about roads and sidewalks, Mm -hmm. Sidewalks has been a huge, Patty, please, okay. a huge issue in the city of Northampton. It seems like we have to wait and wait and wait to repair roads. We have to wait to repair sidewalks. I live out in the rural area, and it's the largest ward throughout the city. And I know I've gone through Patty many times. One area on Florence Road, we've had several people in wheelchairs, very, very dangerous. I finally had a full-blown light put in because of the reconstruction of Route 66. I have an intersection that serves many, many children. We have been waiting on working with Senator Rosenberg and State Rep. Peter Kokot. There's $250,000 sitting for the governor to release. 
How do we actually get this moving to protect all these children who have to go through this intersection that is extremely dangerous? How do you move this when you're talking about somebody's life? That's a great question. Um, uh -huh. I don't know if I exactly have an answer for that. Uh, it's become very uh, serious. Three but three letters will solve that. Well, help with the problem. FHA. They have a new program. They have grants out. Um, just recently, they've come out with an entire book on walkways and sidewalks. Different things you can do with the sidewalk. Right, but she's, talking about a re right but she's talking about a reconstructed intersection that she doesn't feel is safe yeah. for, 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 any, for anybody right. using that um, intersection. And we I, don't you know, have very many sidewalks in my ward. Okay, just Ryan Road and new developments that have come in, mandatory, they have to put their sidewalks in. I've had good luck working with builders, having shelters put at the end or beginning of a development to keep the, the children safe, away from the traffic and that, but the intersections have become a problem where we've had people coming in from East Stanton in wheelchairs going to Florence Heights. And we've still been waiting for a sign with people with disabilities. We haven't seen anything ha happen with that. Do you know anything about that? So, yes. But what, what's happened with that sign? The DPW can't make signs. So how does our ADA coordinator get a sign? Because the Board of Public Works cannot make a sign. Uh, well, uh, you know, there's probably a million and one companies that will sell you the sign. I know Mass Correctional Institute for Industries, which mm -hmm. opens uh, is in Norfolk. I'm trying to remember where they are exactly. Their website isn't operational, but they do have a product catalog that probably has that sign in there that you can order it from. However, I don't know your procurement procedures in, in Northampton on how you would buy it, but um, it should be a pretty simple purchase if to put that up. Now, who gets to decide to put it up? I don't know if engineering the Board of Public Works. You know, I don't know if engineering studies need to be done. That's a little bit out of my venue, but there might be it might be as easy as just popping it up, um, but I'm not sure who gets to decide that in the local municipality. If anybody else has we some comments do on that. that. Um, she cannot do it, I cannot do it. Well, she can recommend strongly to or advise strongly to whomever. Now I can't necessarily see it as a what I'm not hearing is the tie to disability. I mean children, yes, obviously that's Yeah, but there's some in wheelchairs. All right, so you know, I don't know if the parents have to weigh in. Of, you know, if they're if they want even the sign saying, you know, well, I think the sign's going to say probably disabled children, uh, or slow disabled children, or or if it's going to, you know, you could go for the slow, you know, children play area or something. I don't know, really. That's that's a little bit out of my coverage of maybe technically even the ADA coordinator's coverage uh, of where the sign's going to go because that's. Not necessarily determined by so I just want to call on other people who are waiting to speak. Oh, somebody named Don. Yes, um, I wonder if this is a proper venue to talk about uh, changing some handicap parking situations. A lot of people now have wheelchair vans, and many places the VA in Boston has started <coughs> creating uh, wheelchair van only parking <coughs> spots. Um, because really, if you've got a van accessible parking spot, uh, there are a lot of people who are not in wheelchairs who do have vans and use those. And I end up, you know, driving to the other end of the parking lot where I can get my ramp down, mm -hmm. because they're they're taken by people who don't really need them. And I just wonder. And, and a lot of times, the people who are getting out of these things. <coughs> I realize there are hidden disabilities, but these people are really hiding them well. Uh -huh. My other point is, I think it's absolutely the stupidest thing we ever did to uh, report photographs on our tags and then allow people to cover them. The, uh, the excuse was is that they could look at the picture and maybe become a victim, but uh -huh. I mean, they can see you getting out of the car and you can become a victim just because you're crippled. So, there's two parts to that question. I'll, I'll start to address the first part, which is the, the van only spaces. Um, or we're trying to figure out how to restrict only vans or lift equipped vehicles from parking in that space. And right now, you're, you are correct, there's 
every single statute, every single building code, every single you know, law that's out there doesn't restrict a compact car from parking in the van accessible space if, it's if they have a valid plate or placard. So, and I don't know where, it's in, you know, I'm not gonna weigh in on how the community feels fully on that. We've heard both sides. We've heard that, um, number one, there are a limited number of van accessible spaces, which is why the feds actually want to make more available in a parking lot so that you have more of an option to get that space. Um, however, you know, there's not enough handicap parking, regardless of any space you could find that's reserved. Right. right. So, so, and those numbers haven't changed. So the numbers, you know, the, the base number of how many spaces you need to provide are, are still the same. Um, however, the van accessible spaces under the ADA has increased. So you should find more of those at, in larger parking lots, at least. I don't really have a good answer on, on, on really, I mean, it's going to take a building code change, potentially, and it could take a statute change, a legislative change. I think it's Chapter 90, which actually specifies the the wordage that goes on to the handicap parking sign for police to ticket or tow. So in order for someone to get a ticket for being a compact car in a van only lift equipped vehicle space, that's gonna take a, a piece of legislation that'll have to pass probably under chapter 90. Subsection 23 is really where, it's, where that language shows up. Um, so, so I guess that would be the avenue if change was sought. Um, and then potentially you need building code that probably would put a sign on there that says van only, not van accessible. Or, or some other language that would say lift equipped only. Mm -hmm. um, however, as it stands now, you're right, anybody can park there. And the only way to change it is going to be legislatively at this point. Mm -hmm. um, we had a town, I'm trying to remember, there was a, a big box store that had a van only particular, you know, had that, actually had the language that you had. It was, um, you know, van only, lift equipped vehicle only, and there was police picketing that vehicle. Yeah. However, when it flushed out, it realized, you know, it was a different design of a handicapped parking space, and really they were, they were ticketing people who were blocking the access aisle, technically. It wasn't because they weren't a van, it was because they were parking in the hash marks. So, when we flushed it out, but there were some big concerns there about, you know, big thing was right off the bat was, well, it's a non-van parking in a van only space. Well, that's where we had to educate them on the, well, it's not restricted to only van. Well, the way the VA has handled that is they say, can only be used by uh, ramp van, oh. lift van, or people who need to exit their car into a into a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so the building code's gonna spell out how many of those bigger spaces are gonna be provided. Right. Now, uh, any business can actually go above and beyond what the building code calls for and put out their own additional spaces so they could create them all. Number one, they could, all, they could create them all universal. That might be an option where it gives you that 16 feet that you need, the eight foot for the space and the eight foot access aisle, but all of your spaces are that way. Um, or they can put additional parking spaces in there, although the enforcement of only having vans, law enforcement's not gonna do that like they do now for people who park there illegally. Um, but it's just a creation of it. So there are some options already in the building code that could make it easier for people. So maybe if you, the building code were to change to only universal size spaces would be created. Where you have the 11 foot wide parking space, the five foot wide access aisle, that's 16 feet, which is what the standard van accessible space now would be. But you'd have to remove the other options from the building code. So that's an option as well. Yeah. So or option. Patty, you have something? Um, since you probably deal with a lot of communities in Massachusetts, do you have a community that you could say, boy, they really know how to do accessibility the right way, a lot of uh, handicapped parking that is beyond what is required, that businesses just really jump to the... There was one town on the, on the Cape, that, and this was a while ago that I last heard about it, and I can't remember the town, which is the problem that all of their handicapped parking spaces in, in town were the, the universal space, 11 by five, which meant every single, it was they were all van accessible technically. And I'm sorry I'm using the term handicapped accessible. I usually will say designated accessible parking spaces and I'll switch to that from now, but all of the legislative, all of the penalties and all of that stuff, and even the blue and white signs you have there still have that old antiquated term. And mm -hmm. Sorry it's ingrained in my, in my head because that's the, the term we use, but I will 
try to refrain from, from using that term uh, from now on. So, um, but so I think it was like East Ham or one of those communities. They said all of their uh, accessible spaces would be the 11 by fives. Um, that is something I don't know. You know, this question about whether a local municipality can write their own building code as well. So that you know, there's some hesitance to that. So you know, like a town can't require that every single building have an automatic door opener because that's actually going above what our state building code calls for and municipalities aren't allowed to do that. Um, so I would check, <laughs> we could check if, if it was something Northampton wanted to do to make see if an ordinance would be appropriate for that mm -hmm. because it's such a big issue or whatever, I'm not sure what town you're from. Sorry. Way, way in, we don't have any handicap housing. Okay, so that's a problem in its own right, but, uh, but Wayland, if they were trying to approach that or something we could figure out what the appropriate procedure would be. It could be a regulation change. Uh, because a lot, you know, originally when the codes were written back in the 90s, there weren't a whole lot of van, you know, <coughs> lift equipped vans were, were hard to find. Nowadays, they're commonplace. Mm -hmm. So I, it definitely, when you have eight handicap, uh, eight accessible parking spaces and only one of them is van accessible, that's a problem. Because five out of the eight cars could be vans. Vehicles could be vans. So, I'm sorry. Are there any other questions or comments? We have one down here. Um, nope. Nope. Uh, Kevin Scarborough, Town of Deerfield. <clears throat> um, we're in the process now of looking into uh, rehabbing our sidewalks in, in the village of South Deerfield. <clears throat> and what I'm really, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, what I'm really looking for is to making sure that, that we are compliant. Um, you know, I, I understand some of what's required, you know, the the raised dots when you're coming to an intersection. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like widths, and uh, uh, Frank was talking about there's like a, a website or something you can go to. I, I kind of half missed it was FHA. Is that what? FHA.gov. Uh, so, so it's part of the Federal Highway Administration. Yeah. Okay. It actually is. So there are a couple of resources I'd like to throw your way. Sure. And actually I'd like to throw it out to anybody really in mm -hmm. this in this room, whether it be commissions or just general municipality stuff. You've got two really good organizations here. You've got Starbucks, who can help you do that survey or do a plan review. I don't, you got, um, and I don't need to throw you on the bus there. And if you do, do you, guys, you guys do plan reviews. Um, you have MOD, who does plan reviews as well. Um, so what I would like to offer, and it's, it's something I believe Starbucks does as well, that whenever there's a, a project going on, whether it be sidewalks and curb cuts or a municipal project, at least I'll mm -hmm. tell you from my side, and Andy will probably go along with it, um, that before the town takes ownership of a project, um, one of us can come out and, and do a survey, do an audit for you, uh, a walkthrough of that, just purely for accessibility codes, both state and federal. Um, so when you, you know, so that way you as a municipality can get that list beforehand and before you own it, because once you own it, it is now your problem to fix mm -hmm. and your cost unless you litigate it, and that's a whole other avenue. But typically, if you catch it beforehand, it's easier to get the corrections. Because usually, municipalities usually have money pulled back for errors and omissions or, or other things um, that can fix it. So sidewalks and curb cuts might be a little unique because it might be your own town doing it. I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, but you've got contractors and people planning it. So you know, I would assume. You know, unless it's the town doing it themselves. So that's where the plan review can come in. Right. And you know, a walkthrough to ensure you're meeting the compliance. Like maybe you do half, like a quarter of the project, and then we come out and, you know, if you're meeting it, your plans will tell you one thing, the built environment tells you another, right. so never the two shall meet, really, but um, we can at least say, you know, at least help you understand that, yes, they're going to do it right and along the route. Uh, Andy, I don't mean to volunteer you for it, but I think it could be a joint thing or whatever. Um, I do have a comment. Andy, has a question. Andy, first of all, I was oh, just going to follow up on the comment. I, I mean, it may require the town to have a, a building permit. Our permit to do this. Mm -hmm. The building inspector would then also be looking at the AAB. The AAB has regulations for sidewalk width, slopes, and curb cuts. But it's not going to touch the tactile strips you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And right now, correct me if I'm wrong, unless it's a state project, they're not really required. But many municipalities are, okay. are doing it, you know. Um, and it's, it, I mean, it's probably the right thing to do. Yeah. Got to do. Some people don't like them. Obviously, but uh, for, the, for what they're made for, um, they have a great, great purpose. And I'm sure that there's some folks in the room that, that actually use them. Mm -hmm. so yeah, 
that's going to be the trick. Um, you know, that's where really Andy and I can, can, can offer our insight to you or any municipality doing this project to ensure that compliance is not only being met with the ADA, but also with our state building code. Mm -hmm. um, you can definitely offer that up. Um, and, you know, so, you know, yeah, and, uh, and Andy really said it perfectly. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> the kind of, if I could, um, the kind of along still, and, and sorry, I'm kind of stuck on sidewalks. But if, um, Anyway, so uh, I'll go on to my next one. Some of the issue, I shouldn't say issue, but something I see as a safety issue is we have a few people in town that are e either utilizing the, the rascal carts um, and when they're going against traffic, you know, it's not bad. A lot of them will go ahead and they'll, they'll, they'll take something orange and put it across the back. But when they're going against traffic, if a, a car is getting ready to turn left, somebody all of a sudden, you know, because everybody's always in a hurry nowadays, they go ahead, they, they cut that white line and they're going down to the breakdown lane and that's exactly where they are. And this one individual I continually see almost getting hit mm. twice a week. Um, you know, I volunteered up, uh, as you know, I said, we, we've got, we, we, we've got a, a small uh, uh, flagging you can, you can go ahead and put on. And um, he says, I'm not a circus. And, and I wasn't trying to mean any disrespect to the person. I was trying to think of something to, keep, to basically to keep alive. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I was met with strong resistance. You know, obviously, I can't do anything to force anything to him, but I'm just thinking of, who else may have some ideas on what we could do to point him in the right direction to make sure that he doesn't become a statistic? Oh. You guys want to say something? Okay, Patty. Um, I have read that, and this is across the country, that some communities by ordinance or um, by um, regulation um, that people have to have either the um, the flag, which I think you've already identified, that, that it's required that there is no choice that you have to have it. But the other thing, too, is the speed that somebody can go, that it's limited to, um, you know, you're not going 15 miles an hour, you can probably go five miles an hour. So different communities are putting regulations on, on um, the mobility of scooters or chairs that are mobilized um, for the safety of the person. Um, so that, that's all I can offer. We don't do either of those in Northampton. Though somebody just recently had said that um, there should be flags, that it shouldn't be, there should be an ordinance that flags are required because of the safety. Because I've seen a few people almost get um, hit by a car because of the, the, um, the fastness, the speed. So not to use a pun, but I'm gonna throw up a cautionary flag there. Okay. Just because, you know, I know it's been in our office before. Mm -hmm. That I don't, you know, I don't, it's not yours, but it's right. been that that discussion has been in our office before. So, and I think it's laid on the, you know, it's leaned towards the individual right of, you know, it's really their call. You, you know, if you're making everybody who walks down the sidewalk, if there is even a sidewalk, I don't know. Right. that's a different discussion. Right. But anybody using the street or using the sidewalk, if everyone has to carry a flag, then it's it would be okay. Uh, but not just people using mobility devices with it. It's their choice to not wear the bright yellow, you know, vest or, or something to that effect. So I just want to throw some caution there. Um, good intentions sometimes lead to pretty bad, pretty bad lawsuits or decisions. But um, so it's up to the individual of what safety device they want. You know, as much as you may be concerned for that individual, maybe it's looking at, you know, other. So number one, other sidewalks there or. Yeah. And are they so bad he's forced to ride the street, or is it that he just chooses it, not to ride the street? I, I think there's sections. There's there's some sections that that need to be rehabbed. There's definitely no doubt about it. So, but the, there so are definitely <coughs> sections that are, good. Are, are like the day they were poured, yes. and they basically just refuse to use the sidewalk. Okay. So, so I just want to finish my first thought with Patty. The, the speed limit on the sidewalk that is totally within the realm of drafting policies for it and, and stuff like that. Um, the, the safety equipment stuff, I'm going to throw a cautionary flag for that one. Um, just because it, it may go a little too far for, for what the intent or for the protection of the individual. 
So getting the person to ride the sidewalk, I'm not, and maybe people can weigh in on this, um, I'm not sure about the law of that. If there's a sidewalk, are you required to walk on it or use it? The problem, the question, so this individual, if, depending on how frequently he uses that area, may not know that they can get on one side of the sidewalk or one area of the sidewalk, but 300, 500, 700 feet down the road, there's gonna be a spot where they can't get on. You can't get off it. Right. So they may choose to ride the street because they know that mm -hmm. there's gonna be that barrier there. And um, so as a town, I'm strongly suggesting that that be part of your transition plan to figure out when and how that's gonna be fixed. And depending on how frequently he uses it, maybe that, not just for one individual, you know, right. it's, you know, but you're gonna bump it up on the priority list to figure out what we can fix, what would make it usable for that individual. Um, because again, you know, there could be litigation if, 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 if the best it does get. If you hear about those stories every every year, right. you know that someone's because of either snow on the sidewalks or bad sidewalks, people are on the road and they get hit, and um, that's just a liability waiting for the for the town. So, yeah. so trying to address that, having a plan in place, is going to hopefully help you in that process. Um, oh, okay. So, okay. So okay. what I'm really looking for is guidance on. Can any, you know, what can force them up on the sidewalk? I don't know if that's <laughs> public safety, if that's a law or, or anything like that, but you know, it's the personal choice as well, I think. So. Yeah. If I may, John? Uh, we had a problem a couple of years ago where people were complaining about wheelchairs in the street after that's been all kinds of fun. That went through a, a lot of hoopla and actually the Registry of Motor Vehicles came out in one article and said that wheelchairs are supposed to follow the same rules as a bicycle. And unfortunately, if you go a little further on, the next one says, well, bicycles aren't allowed on the sidewalk in a business district. So you've got conflicting. Uh, also requires you wear a helmet on the bike. And yeah. So there's a whole yeah. lot of. And that means you're supposed to go through that. Yeah. Eventually. Okay, so we have time for one more question. Right. I think Don had his hand up. I have had, had a comment. Uh, as I recall, in South Deerfield, the sidewalks have a grass strip between that and the street. Correct. And you might consider putting in bike lanes with, with a marker and getting rid of the grass. So we... Um, we have some refreshments planned. We want to make sure to have time for that. We want to invite you all to join us so that we can all get to know each other a little bit. But in wrapping up, I'm just wondering if people have thoughts. Um, what are our next steps? It's been great having everyone here today. And um, perhaps we should have another meeting or maybe plan quarterly meetings. Or what do people think? Has this been useful? It's been very useful. In fact, uh, Andy here has a group that gets together and there's like five or six of our cities that uh, Disabilities Access Network, which we go out and do accessibility uh, and uh, go around and actually they look at the best and tell them that, yes, you're the best. Give them awards. Oh, that's great. I have to say I like that idea. And um, I like that idea. The so. meeting is a little bit, wait a minute, Corey, a little bit different than what I thought it was going to be. But I think that's excellent that you are doing that. I think that's great. And that's what I was hoping that we would have gotten out of this meeting. Mm -hmm.
which is a very steep uh, train bridge, uh, basically, and you can't see him until you're very close to the top. So there had to be something done with it. Filing complaints twice, but uh, yeah, you can do it. It works. Oh, okay, so thank, like thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for being here with us, and we'd like to invite you all now to join us for refreshments. Thank you for having me out. I look forward to working with you guys all in the future. So please come.